I'm really excited to get into this episode because we're going to talk about standing out, making yourself known, making more money, and something that I haven't heard yet and I'm really interested to dive into is the renegade archetypes that you talk about. They're not based on any of the other personality profiles that people are used to, like the DISC or some of the other things everybody knows about. Um, I believe that we fall into four uh, personality styles. And then there's nuances, of course, but hmm. to get started, you're either a nurturer, disruptor, innovator, or a geek. You're listening to Entrepreneur Journeys, where I share insights and strategies based on owning and managing businesses while traveling and living on three continents. I also interview business owners about their journey, what they learned along the way, and how that can help you with your business growth. For more resources to accelerate your entrepreneur journey, head over to gapologist.com, where I share resources, events, community, and more. I'm your host, Joe Matz. Let's get started. Hello, hello, and welcome to another edition of Entrepreneur Journeys. Today, I have with us Ann Bennett, and she helps purpose-driven entrepreneurs stand out online so they can speak with confidence, sell with authority, and have a steady stream of the right fit clients so they are making more money. Welcome to the show, Ann. Thank you, Joe. Thank you so much for having me. It is a great pleasure to have you here today. And just for our guests, where do you hail from this morning? I am in uh, Costa Mesa, California, which is uh, Orange County, Newport oh. Beach area. Oh, okay. Beautiful. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Great. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm really excited to get into this episode because we're going to talk about standing out, making yourself known, making more money, and something that I haven't heard yet, and I'm really interested to dive into, is the renegade archetypes that you talk about. Right, right. They're, uh, I made them up, actually. Uh, they're not based on any of the other personality profiles that people are used to, like the DISC or some of the other things everybody knows about. Um, I believe that we fall into four uh, personality styles. And then there's nuances, of course, but hmm. to get started, you're either a nurturer, disruptor, innovator, or a geek. And then we go from there and build out your standout brand. Okay. So can we talk about each archetype and what the characteristics might be? Sure. Yeah, I think, you know, um, the nurturer, I like to use uh, classic archetypes like Oprah. You know, they're, they're loving, they're the kind of person when you walk into a room, they're the one that's giving you the big hug, whether you're a man or a woman, they're kind of like cuddly, huggy, really warm, very nurturing, spiritual, um, generous, that type of personality. We all know this person that we walk into a room and they're like, ah, I feel like I know you. You know, that instant kind of warm connection, that's a nurturer. Uh, disruptor, I like to use Madonna as a, a classic iconic type, her or Lady Gaga. They're bold, they're brassy. They love to upset the status quo. Uh, they can be very creative, but they're also very rebellious in a sense of freedom fighting. They're interested in... Uh, human rights, humanity, anything that has to do with the social, um, our social uh, structures. Uh, they're very interested in um, saying something kind of sassy and off the cuff that other people think but would never say out loud. <laughs> I know people like that. <laughs> are those people, right? I'm one of those people. Um, then you have the innovator. <clears throat> which is someone who, uh, so let me take a sip of water here. There's someone who really has um, future ideas, they're visionaries, 
and then they bring that into present moment. So I like to think of Steve Jobs, even Elon Musk, although he's a little bit more of a bad boy, he kind of falls into the disruptor category. Right. But uh, Steve so, Jobs was like super creative. He was just yeah. interested in the things that he was interested in, um, in terms of, you know, having little devices and having all your music on a small device and things like that. And then you have the geek who is more like um, Bill Gates, someone who's more of a researcher, someone who's more of a, you know, they have a plan for everything and they know where they're going, even if they don't do it perfectly. Mm -hmm. They have a roadmap, you know, we all know these people. I love to hire them. You know, they're great for creative people to have on their team. Like, yes. oh, where am I, where's my map? Where am I going? What am I doing? Somebody else is handling that. Sounds and like it's a it's a good balance to the creative person who may not be such a good planner. Yeah, they're usually a little more spontaneous. Creative people are, you know, in the moment, sure. changing ideas. Their passions switch around a lot. <laughs> um, where your geeks are more like, okay, this is what we said we're going to do. Here's our plan. Here's the dates. This is what we're following. They're a lot more more uh, oriented to structures. Okay. So you mentioned someone like Elon Musk who has um, characteristics of a disruptor, but also characteristics of an innovator. Mm -hmm. Is it normal that people would have um, have traits? Like, like kind of uh, overflowing or bleeding into other archetypes? Yeah. You know, we're, as human beings, you know, we're multifaceted, right? We're not just one thing or another, but when you, when it comes to branding, you know, the brain is filtering. It's a filter. It filters things out. We've got all this stimulation. I like to call it digital dementia. Hmm. And, uh, you know, we've got a lot of stimulation, a lot of options. So we're constantly trying to filter. The brain is filtering uh, things out so that you're only seeing essentially things that you're looking for or that you're interested in. So with the, the difference between the innovator and the disruptor is that a lot of entrepreneurs start out as disruptors. And right. as they grow and build teams and have other people actually doing the work, then they're, they're moving into an innovator, more of an innovator's attitude. Innovators have teams of people that actually create their vision. They come up with the ideas and the vision and they have other people that execute everything. Uh, disruptors ha are a little more, um, hands-on if you will and they like to do stuff that's just crazy like i think of um uh you know elon musk it's like oh i'm putting cars on mars yes <laughs> right well he sent yeah. one into space didn't he yeah well I, I you know when you were mentioning that i was thinking of david bowie yeah david bowie who actually changed personas throughout his career from the, the businessman with the suit to someone like Ziggy Stardust. Exactly. Right. He, he's, you know, he was always changing and pretty much, you know, a um, disruptor has a level of shock value, if you will, hmm. that they naturally are excited about. Okay. Where innovators are a little more serious. I think of, of the disruptors are more of a peacock and the innovators are more like a lion. They're not necessarily flashy. They're kind of understated, but the the disruptors are definitely like, you know, all eyes over here. Right, right. <laughs> like, over here. like they want to be the center of attention where an innovator, you know, it's not it's not really their focus so much. Okay. Now, I imagine each of the four types have different ways that they would go about building a business or starting a business. Totally. So if you're a geek, you're going to be doing tons of research. You're going to be making sure that you're doing all of the planning. Everything is 
you know, we all plan with the end in mind, but some of us that are more action, like an action oriented person is more of a disruptor and um, an innovator where a geek is, they, they want to know the answer before they actually get to it. Or they like to do a lot of upfront um, due diligence, research, research, marketing research, all that kind of stuff to make sure that the idea is really solid, where more of an action type of a person, an innovator or um, a disruptor would just be like, yeah, let's go do it. Let's do the it. And a team of people to do it. Let, let me get my team together and all my experts would do it. The disruptor would be like, oh, I totally got this. And they'll just run off in some direction. They're usually very spontaneous. Yeah, it sounds like they need someone to come behind them and kind of kind of put the pieces together. <laughs> Pick up the pieces. <laughs> they all, everyone needs a team, but I would say, you know, your, your disruptor and your innovator definitely need team support to to get them their ideas and their stuff really solid mm -hmm. and consistent where the nurturer and the geek are the geek is definitely the solid and consistent person it sounds like the geek almost needs someone to light a fire under his feet yeah um I would say and, like the disruptor is more like a fire starter right <laughs> so like the um the geek i think of analysis paralysis if they're doing too much of that analyzing and because the world is changing, right? And it changes so fast these days. Um, you got to just get out there and, you know, my thing is dip your toe in the water or fail fast or, you know, imperfect action, all of those things. Absolutely. Get it out yeah. there. You want to get going because, because of that, because we're in a cycle where, you know, you blink and everything's changed. From the left, you're like, oh, well, it was like Facebook, and now it's like TikTok, or you know, Twitter turned its name to X. <laughs> right. Like, what? <laughs> what? You're like, what? So, yeah. What you do know, we? Do? So we don't tweet anymore, do we? On Twitter, what? What do we do? We X. I don't. I don't know. I, don't know. I guess we. Uh, yeah. Twex. <laughs> <laughs> uh, somebody must have come up with something. I. You know, the tweet was so, it was kind of cute, you know, it kind of made sense. And it's a little tiny tweet. It's 140 characters. Right. It makes total sense, right? No, I, I don't I, know. I, when it first came out, I was laughing so hard. I was like, how am I going to say anything? <laughs> but it, it's great to be able to communicate in a, a small sound bites, you know, or tiny little concepts, because that's really, at this point, because our, our attention span is somewhat of a small goldfish, it's probably yes. the goldfish probably has more focus than we do at this so, point. But, you know, we have smart machines that help us out. Yeah, they can focus for us. Oh, no. <laughs> What's, which of the four archetypes have, have the most, um, how, how would you say, um, patience? Oh, that's really interesting. Would not be the disruptor or the innovator. They want to get going. They are very much action oriented and they're not. Um, yeah, they're they're on fire. Those people are more like on fire. Um, patient. I would say the nurturer is probably the most patient because your geeks can be like, like I have, I have a very good friend that's also an entrepreneur and whenever I need a spreadsheet, I just call her and she, it's like, she's so excited to do a spreadsheet. <laughs> and I'm like, that's a, my least favorite thing. I like to know, but I don't like to do the thing that makes me know. It's like really funny. But um, I just call her and she does the spreadsheet for me and she gets all excited. I would say the, but I would say the most patient would be the nurturer because they're much more, um, grounded and listening so would you say they're more others focused uh not necessarily i mean i think everybody is as entrepreneurs everybody is other focused but i would say the geek and the nurturer are more other focused than um the disruptor and the innovator okay and, and it's a scale everyone is, of it is to their demise 
(laughs) (laughs) from my point of view. Um, But, you know, like both the geek and the nurturer need um, an innovator and a disruptor to to ignite and and move them along because they can move a lot uh, slower, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, actually. Moving slow is really a good thing. Uh, that I've learned over time, <laughs> falling down a lot. <laughs> it's like, oh, if I just went a little bit slower, with a little more focus, with a little more. So, you know, were, were you channeling like, your disruptor side when you were doing that? When I was going really fast. Yes. Yeah, my disruptor is like, let's make it happen. You know, it's really a fire starting kind of idea. Let's let's inspire and engage and get everybody excited and make this thing happen, even though there's nothing, there's no structure yet. Right. Let me put it that way. The geek part would have the structure, you know, so I've learned for myself just over the years that, um, you know, people love a structure because they love to feel safe. There's a safety factor when you have a structure or a methodol. I have a methodology, but it's not as as step by step by step by step as a lot of people feel uh, super comfortable in. It's like, oh, I've been down this path and here's the steps that you take to get there. That's great, but it also can stifle creativity. It can, can stifle innovation when you are following in somebody else's footsteps. Right. I That's think, why I made yeah. like my own archetypes because the, the archetype idea has been around since Carl Jung sure. and a lot of psychologists and people use it um, on many, many levels. But it's, it's really, for me, I was like, well, of course, I have to have my own. <laughs> yeah, of I've, course. And well, one that makes sense to you and that allows you to work with people um, the way that they want to be worked with because we're all on our individual journey and although the journeys may be similar and may run parallel it's right. they're very individual um, they're all I, different it's kind of like your 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 body you know your bi- your biome your your body every body has a heart and a liver and all the components, but we're actually all different. Yes. How we interpret things, how we see things, what we, what we're interested in, what we're not interested. We're all different in that way. And for me, it's always about being unapologetically yourself, Hmm. taking everything that you are and making it work. Um, And when you're not good at something, making that work like have somebody else do it or bring it in as, oh, well, that's part of my charm and charisma. And, you know, that's why I'm a genius because I make all these mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, that's, we're yeah. The opposite way. Especially <laughs> women. We're trained as, oh, I need to be perfect. I need to be the best. I need to be all these things. And in business, it's not always the best that is super successful. Right. Would you like to get in front of more of your ideal clients and at the same time, build your brand and create evergreen content? Well, you can do that with podcast guesting. This very moment, you're listening to a podcast that may have been published today or three weeks ago or three years ago. In a very real sense, you're engaging with the speakers, hopefully enjoying yourself and learning something new at the same time. And you're getting to know the guest and how they help their clients, their customers, and the problems that they solve. You may even be their ideal client and want to learn more about them and download one of their free resources you can find in the show notes or maybe even become a client of theirs. See, when you're a guest on a podcast, you will enjoy that same kind of engagement. It is perhaps the easiest, most cost-effective way to get in front of new audiences. Learn how you can be a guest on the right podcast and engage with your ideal clients with the free resources available at gapologist.com. Right. It's not always the smartest person or the, the 
It's almost there. There's a line that I love that one of my mentors uses all the time. Are you dumb enough to be rich? And because when you're really smart, you have a tendency to really overanalyze and overthink things and look at all of the angles. And when you can see everything, then it's, then you take a percentage of what the risk structure is for doing that. And pretty much by that time, as we're talking about, it's changed so fast. You're like, right. <laughs> you're left and, in the dust, right? And, you know, most people, they if you're too smart and you're too into it, you're talking at a level that most people won't be able to pick up on. Well, they don't understand it and they don't have the expertise right. but to know. So I, when I first started my career, I worked a lot with PhD psychologists for that very reason. Super accomplished people, very smart, uh, super educated. And I, they would talk and I would go, okay, well, how can we say that so that a normal person understands what you just said? <laughs> right. I, mean, I find it really fascinating and it, for marketing language, we we need to um, to make it that people can relate to. So we end up writing a lot of stories and doing things that bring everybody into uh, a person's energy and what they actually believe in. You know, it's like stories and have been being told for hundreds of thousands of years. They're very effective. Very effective. Yes. Yes. And I, I've also heard that when you write, you should write at a is this a fifth grade level. Yes. Fifth or sixth grade. Uh, we think of that as being really um, some, some people think that's dumb. It does sound uh, dumb. It's not, though. Uh, the New York Times is written on a sixth grade level. Hmm. Children are very smart. <laughs> Children are very smart. Yes, indeed. You know, their vocabularies are pretty big and but we think of it as like yeah sixth grade level or i like to say to people if you can say your tagline to your six-year-old and they understand what you just said you got something going on uh, that's a good test yeah you know the words are too big or they're they're too abstract for a lot a lot of us think very abstractly and we think that that's communicating when it's like what did you just say? <laughs> right. Tell right. me more. You have to explain it. If you have to explain, then you then you need to go back to the drawing board. Yes. Yes, that's true. So you've got to bring it down to the fifth grade level. And it's not always easy to do if you... It's actually very... Um, you have to be very smart, actually. You have to, to be very smart to dumb it down enough. <laughs> yeah, right. To simplify. S simplicity is brilliance, really. Yes. Anybody can make anything complex. Right. Talking too much, explaining too much, um, trying to really get in granularly and explain something. When somebody's, we were talking about this previously, Joe, you know, somebody's capacity is up here. Uh, in a, you know, what they can grasp of the concepts and the ideas is usually simple and foundational. And as you work with someone, you know, like you or someone like me, that's got more, more experience and, and knowledge and wisdom, you know, you're going deeper, 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 deeper levels. But when you're starting with people, you want to give them a feeling. You want to give them a feeling that they can do something right or they're inspired it's like oh not like it's so simple or easy or you never have to work but it's more like oh i could actually do that i can actually have a podcast or i could actually brand my business i could it's because you're breaking it down into right. simple form now most complicated subjects and complicated things can be broken down into easy bite-sized pieces. One of my clients is a techie, a very, very much a geek, right? Very much a techie. And she recently has, has gone into like a manager role, which like a team lead role. Mm -hmm. And we work together on communication, how to communicate to these new people mm 
who might be 20 years her younger and how to communicate to them when for her it's so easy where she'll go off and say something I'm like wait a minute wait what's that word mean and that's what those those new folks are going to say so you've got to I always teach her to um, get the 20,000 foot level view and assume that they don't know what you know and what you've worked with for 20 years. So you have right. to test. Otherwise, I mean, there, there are trainings that she's been on. She told me they're they learning a new technology and, and the people just start assuming that you know, you know, 20% of what they're going to be teaching today. And you can be lost right from the first sentence. Exactly. It's crazy. So yeah. I think it's like, you know, that's the beauty of working with someone who's really masterful. They can break something down and explain it in very simple terms. Yep. And that's what, you know, branding is really about that. Branding is about a feeling and it's about somebody understands it from the get go. They might not know all the little nuances or all the little things that your company does, but they have a feeling about it. So it's like people are going to be attracted to, let's just say, Apple, the, sim the whole simplicity of it and how beautiful, beautifully it's designed, that simplicity. They're going to love that. Other people are going to be like, fair. You know, I like Microsoft. I like the way it's organized. You know, it's a different mind, the way that minds are working a little bit differently. So all of that comes into play when you're communicating with your clients and they're all different. So really. let's let's dive into a little bit of simplicity in branding. Mm -hmm. And how might someone uh, incorporate that? simplicity, that idea of simplicity into their brand, yet still communicate what their brand is about and, and the benefit that clients can have by by adhering and, and um, getting in that brand's ecosystem. Yeah, I think that, you know, it's a really great question and it's rather complex, actually. However, you know, when you think about some a company like Apple, you know, they were going under in the 80s. They fired their yeah. visionary. <laughs> Not too smart, but okay. Uh, they fired Steve Jobs. And when they brought him back, he um, developed the Think Different campaign, which is then what started to, to bring all the creatives and all the people that felt different and had aspirations in the world uh, to using the Apple. And now they're uh, something crazy like a $2.7 trillion business in the world. They made everything very, very simple and very direct. And in, it's all in the experience right. of it. So and we all enjoy different types of experiences too, right? So everyone that's going to be going to that brand are going to be people that align with that philosophy of they want to make, make a big splash and impact and influence in the world. They want it to be really simple and beautiful and a certain type of experience uh, where another brand is going to, be leading with something else like people don't understand I think that branding is about something other than the product okay it's explain not, a, little, a little bit more about that it's like um, you know as a woman we're all very used to knowing about Spanx and as a man you might have experienced them on, on someone but you know, they're, they're basically, it's not about lingerie or underwear for women that's really comfortable. It's actually confidence is what she sells. She's selling confidence. She's not selling underwear. Just like Steve Jobs is not selling computers. Hmm. He's basically selling simplicity and creativity. So people need to understand that their brands are not the thing that they sell it's a 
bigger it's a it's a bigger perception of what it is so you talk so, about feeling um yeah it's more of a feeling it's more of a feeling all right so take something all right uh, now one that's very clear to me is is the energy drink red bull right and they have all of these adventure commercials and people jumping out of airplanes and bicycles coming off of mountains and stuff really neat stuff but they're selling would it be correct they're selling an adventure lifestyle or they're selling extreme sports Exper they st everything extreme extreme sports everything extreme so the guys that started red bull were into extreme sports and they started when they brought their drink out they went to all these extreme sports events that's where it got started and then of course everyone takes their stuff to college kids <laughs> the test market will you drink this right <laughs> is always a college kid and um but i think with them everything was about extreme so extreme energy when you think about red bull there's lots of other energy drinks out there right but if you ask people when you say energy drink or extreme energy they're going to say red bull yes definitely like that boom it's it's not uh, monster or any of the other other ones out there that I don't really drink them but you know that people drink right well monster <laughs> yeah talking about energy drinks monster just I don't remember seeing much advertising about monster energy drinks yeah I mean I, I just remember the logo right with the green right it looks kind of spooky it looks like yeah. Halloween type stuff <laughs> now you can be a monster drink our drinks I don't yeah, I don't know. You turn into the Incredible Hulk or something. <laughs> <laughs> this green drink, you turn green and you're big. Yeah, whatever. But um, I think as we've gotten more complex and complicated in our society, the, the simplicity of directness and communication mm. becomes more and more important to be able to say what you do. Like my tagline is liberate your rebel spirit and rake in the revenue. It's basically just saying what I do. Right, right. Without telling you, oh, it's branding and messaging and marketing and you know, being yourself and oh, that's a lot of words. Plus people are like, well, how do you do that? <laughs> that's when you get to explain it. Right. Yes. Yeah. Now I, I invented or I, I, I um, took the word gapologist.com. Nice. And one of the reasons I took that is because people don't really know that word. That word is not out there a lot. And I've gotten the question so many times, Anne, when I'm on networking groups or, or you know, Zooms, and they're like, what is a gapologist? And I'm like, that's exactly why I use that word. <laughs> That causes curiosity. Yes. Right? So part of branding is to create novelty and curiosity, hmm. especially in, in your marketing. And uh, so that's what that does. It, it's this word that you created. And then people are like, well, tell me, tell me more. What is it? Right. So let's talk about, we've talked about the big companies. Let's talk about solopreneurs and small businesses and how can they create simplicity in their branding and communicate that value or or that feeling i think it's really important for people to explore and they kind of oh, i don't know i started my business i just ran out and wanted to get clients <laughs> I, like, I think many well, most people start that way <laughs> it, is. And it was a little bit like ignorance on fire <laughs> me. and you know when it works it works really well and when it doesn't work it's doesn't work really well. well they say if if you if you catch on fire with enthusiasm people will come from miles to watch you burn <laughs> yeah all right that's great i have to remember that. that's awesome so i think you know um as a, as a solopreneur or a small business you want to spend some time writing i i have my clients do a lot of writing on um what breaks your heart and what pisses you off hmm. when you can 
really start to just allow yourself to brain dump what those things are, you'll start to see um, patterns and you'll start to see threads of your values. So a lot of people talk about mission and, and vision and all that. I talk about manifestos. So if you want to create a, your business that's bigger than the product, you create a manifesto that other people can align behind. And a lot of people don't spend time, the time to do it. I have a methodology for it, so I can really uh, pull that out of people in about 30 minutes and write something that makes that would inspire people to work with them. Yes. So you're looking within a manifesto type thing or or hooks or sound bites. You're looking to inspire people to want to be with you because they're they believe what you believe. Right. You're looking for people who, uh, you know, I like to say your tribe. Yeah. You're looking for people who believe what you believe and who who want um there's a similarity, there's a togetherness that is created, and you'll repel a lot of people also. You repel everybody that doesn't, they don't relate to that, right? right. Like, oh, I, this happens to me all the time. People are like, oh, you're just, I'm not a rebel. I don't really get your thing. I don't understand, you know, I'm not that person. Or there are people that are like, they just are mesmerized, right? They're like, oh, I want to be with Anne because she's like uber creative and she connects these weird dots that I never thought about and comes up with all these things that are really fascinating. So I think, you know, that's what a brand actually does. It, it attracts and repels at the same time, mm. which is great because you end up working with people that you totally love to work with. Right, which is absolutely awesome. Yeah, isn't it great? That's the way to do it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't. I don't want to work with people who I don't like or going to give going to question everything I say. Yeah. No, they are not my clients, and that's fine. They can yeah. be clients of other people, which is great. There's exactly. seven or eight billion people in the world. Exactly. Right? There's a, there's other people that that can serve them. Yes. So better because they align with with them right. you know they understand them or they feel understood and um that's where i think the archetypes really help people because because if i know you're a geek i'm going to talk to you in a particular way <laughs> that i wouldn't talk to a disruptor that way you well, know that it makes perfect be. sense yes so that's that's where those are very very helpful also i think people can use them to understand well if you're an innovator you need to surround yourself with the other three. Yes, definitely. Because they'll be nurturing that you're going to be lacking because you're an innovator. You know, Steve Jobs wasn't the nicest guy. Right. 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 So he had other people on his team that were more the, the public service people and, and, and doing things that are more relationship oriented. Yes. Um, it's important. It's good. Sure. Well, I mean, we can't we can't be everything. And that's why we need teams. We need people around us who are different than us. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Left to my own devices, I can be a little bit of a, a hurricane. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, and we have come to the part in our interview that I like to call the lightning round. Are you Yay. ready? How has your entrepreneurial journey transformed you? Oh my goodness. I am not the same person as when I started. I thought I thought it was going to be really easy. I was like, ah, oh, that's easy. I've done a lot of things in my life. I worked at Vogue magazine. I've lived in New York City for 25 years. How hard could it be? And I think that that was um, very humbling, hmm. super humbling. Also learning to slow down learning to go slow to really go fast is uh, a big, big thing for me. Yeah, for a disruptor, I can imagine. It's very, it's a, <laughs> it's a tough, tough thing to, to um, internalize, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and really change, you know, change, develop. I've developed a lot of 
Um, I was always very tenacious and persistent, but I've developed a lot of listening skills, a lot of uh, patience, if you will. I can even use that term in my vocabulary, but um, more uh, quiet, Hmm. more quietness. Okay. Interesting. So what most surprised you as a business owner? How long it can take to do something. Has <laughs> <laughs> this done yet? That's kind of my thing. Are we, are we through this? Did you guys do this yet? Is there a, I'm kind of like that. Um, I think it's very surprising how much um, money it takes. Hmm. I'll say that. How much um, resources you need to create or or find if you don't have, um, enroll other people in helping you uh, to actually be able to build a business. Yeah. Yeah. Especially when you get into the scaling phase. Yeah, yeah. The scaling phase is where, you know, the big mistakes and, um, the big money and that, you, that's right. you're like, Oh, I did that and it didn't work. And then I did it again and it didn't work. And then you make a tiny tweak and you're like, Oh my God, it's like, Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And stuff happens. What unexpected challenges have you had to overcome? I think the biggest thing for me, and it's a constant, um, is growth and development, uh, inner worth, uh, inner how I talk to myself, um, how I perceive failure. Uh, because there's a lot of it. I'm not someone who says, oh, you don't, it's not failure until you quit or whatever. I'm like, no, <laughs> something works or it doesn't work, okay? Rocks are hard, water is wet. I'm okay if I win. I'm okay if I lose. I think that that's the biggest thing for me that it's been appreciating the journey, hmm. appreciating each step. Uh, my capacity is expanding each step, each, whether it's successful or unsuccessful is a learning opportunity to see things in a way that you're actually moving forward. And you know how people always say two steps forward, three steps back right. or whatever. I don't believe in that. I think that that's BS. I just think we're always expanding when we're on this journey, this entrepreneurial journey is totally different as far as I can tell from anything else in life. I, I think so. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Probably the most challenging thing I've ever done. And for some people, it's kind of like having kids. You don't know how to do that. Yeah. <laughs> No, you learn along the way and you make mistakes yeah. along the way. And they're all different. I yes. mean, the personalities and what they're going to be like is all different. So it's not like, oh, I could just, this is the playbook for how this is going to go. It's really not like that. No, and, that could be very frustrating and could, um, um, you could uh, turn in, you know, uh, the children could be, <laughs> could, could become very <laughs> difficult in later years if, if you do that. Yes. yes. Potentially it could be really a uh, challenge. <laughs> so, you know, I think learning, learning that everything is about solving a problem. Hmm. It's all about, you, you choose the entrepreneurial journey. You choose, you are someone who wants to solve problems. Yes. And I think the, that way. the business growth kind of parallels personal growth. Mm -hmm. And you referred to that. And I, I believe that is completely true. And my belief is you can't grow any bigger. You can't grow your business any bigger than you grow yourself. Yeah. Yep. Because the challenges get, they get bigger and bigger. Right. right. So it's like, okay, if you are 
acting like if I was acting the way I acted when I started my business, I was on, like I was on fire the whole time. Everything was a disaster. I was crying every other day on the couch going, oh, this doesn't work. You know? <laughs> I mean, I, I wouldn't survive and I wouldn't be where I am today. Sure. It's you have to grow have and to kind grow. of go, well, you know. It's yeah. not that big of a deal. I got this. That's right. Handle. Grow. Just learn. Learn along the way. Right. I don't know how to do this. I'm calling my other friends. Perfect. <laughs> but no. And what book has made a big impact on you? And who would you recommend that book to? Oh my God, I have. I read a lot. Um, the biggest impact. I, I'm. You know, I kind of go from, I listen to a lot of podcasts in the morning when I'm walking and working out. Um, and so I'm constantly buying things. But um, one of my favorite books is The Buddha and the Badass by uh, Vishen Lakhiani, the guy that founded Mind Valley. Um, I like the way he speaks hmm. and how he breaks down these concepts that we've been talking about, you know, he's built a billion dollar business and he's gone through all the phases of start sleeping on a couch, you know, and using his money and, and being a yoga teacher. <laughs> right. Oh, interesting. I, I, I have not heard of that book. Yeah. It's a great book. Um, my other favorite is uh, Jim quick limitless. Yes. You know, Jim? yeah, I love Jim. Yep. Good. Um, if I would slow down enough to actually study <laughs> story of my life, um, study, I am always constantly studying with, with him, some of his programs and stuff, because they're so, uh, you know, teaching you how to learn, hmm. how to retain information, um, how to make decisions, things like that things that I was never taught in school. Right. So much. So much we learn as entrepreneurs was never taught in, in school or in, in personal development. Right. Very little personal development is taught in school. I think that's that's a big mistake, but I won't get on my rant about that. Yeah, that's a big rant in my world, too. <laughs> if we really want to change the world. If we really want to affect our children, if we really want to help them, we should teach them how to learn what to learn and how, but mostly how to learn, not how, even what. And how to and think for themselves. And, yeah, and you know, how to think, how to, how to think. Act, make decisions. Right. You know, entrepreneurs, we're making decisions all day long. And I think that's the other thing that was probably some of my biggest growth is to be able to make a decision, make it right in that moment, and then make adjustments along the way, yep. depending on how well that decision went. And, and that's an important point that you bring up. A, a lot of folks, I have seen them labor and stress over decisions. And decisions don't need to be final, don't need to be the final word. You make a decision and then you make adjustments along the way. And it's it's the way the world goes. I mean, you, you think about when we started sending rockets into space and, and a rocket to the moon. Yeah, exactly. They, the rockets were aimed at the moon, best we could do with mathematics, and shot up there. But along the way, they had to make micro adjustments so that mm -hmm. the rocket actually hit that huge ball in the sky. And we have to do the same when we move forward. We, we, we don't have all the answers in the beginning because we haven't been where we need to be to see the issues that come up. Exactly. And then, you know, I mean, I was raised so differently than how entrepreneurs, a lot of my friends have had parents that were entrepreneurs, that were business owners. Uh, my dad was a high school principal. So it was a very different, very different yeah. headset. Um, but that whole idea of, you know, everyone thinks they have to make the, the right decision. The right decision is if it's right 51% of the time, you win. Well, that's true, too. That's <laughs> a stockbroker's chant. <laughs> right. You're winning. So it's like, you know, it's a little bit like, uh, 
it is like that. It's a, there's a guidance system that right. decision making should be following. What is the correct step right now in this moment, you know, and also serves the long, the long game is like, okay, this is moving me towards that. And, you know, what we have a tendency to do is shoot something out there. And if it doesn't work, then trash that, shoot another thing out there. Right. No, it, you know, it's, it's, and this is a whole podcast episode on itself on how to make decisions that you can make micro adjustments to without throwing out the baby with the bath water. You know, and, mm-hmm. and that, that's a whole podcast in itself. That might be a very good and interesting That could be a episode. good one, yeah, because yeah. it really is micro-adjustments. That's little, right, yeah. Little tiny, little tiny um, tweaks. Yeah, when you want to change a habit, it's the same thing. You don't just, like, wake up one day and decide to go to the gym all, at one, all in one day. It's right. very small, and the smaller you can, it's back to simplicity, okay? Simplicity, the smaller yeah. you can make it and be successful in that small piece, then you do another piece, and then you do another right. piece. You know, I was always the kid that would bite off more than she could chew. <laughs> that was the nature of my personality. <laughs> and now I'm learning, you know, the the atomic habits, the tiny, mm, the right. tiny things that you do that over a long period of time create big change or they they call it small hinges that swing big doors it's there's the the compound effect of small actions it's i always heard you know the story of the man who ate a cake He he ate a full cake and he said look i haven't gained any weight i'm still in shape next day it eats another cake this isn't affecting me. I don't know what everyone's talking about. But after a month of eating a cake every day, uh, he started to need larger pants. And, you know, it didn't work out so well because of the accumulated effect. But we can all take small actions that will accumulate into large actions. And we, we hear people talk about just read a book, just 10 minutes a day. If you can only do 10 minutes a day, you can read six or seven books in a year. Yeah, that would be different if you haven't read six or seven books previously. Yeah, I think we get stuck on. I don't know if it's our culture exactly. It's kind of like the uh, a friend of mine came to me the other day, and I said, "How long have you been in your business?" And she goes, "Well, eighteen years." And I was like, "That's great. Only two more years, and you're going to be an overnight success." <laughs> oh, <gosh. laughs> All right, let's yeah, move. You know, Let's move on to the last question. (laughs) What advice would you give to an aspiring entrepreneur who wants to have success in your industry? That's a really great question. Um, I would say find somebody who's already been there and done what you want to do that you like. Like we're talking about personalities aligning. Um, and do a lot of growth and development. A lot of growth and development. Yeah, mindset work. Uh, mm-hmm. However you like to do it. I like hypnotherapy and, and NLP and all sorts of stuff to get into my subconscious. Mm. I pretty much know everything that I know. <laughs> <laughs> There's just stuff that I don't know that I that's back there that's running the show. Oh, boy. So, um, <laughs> That's really important. Hmm. Um, I believe 90% of building the business is your mindset, hmm. what you believe you're capable of. I mean, we all can go, oh, yeah, you know, I'm going to be so successful and I'm going to make millions of dollars and blah, blah, blah. And then you, all you have to do is look at your life to see how you actually think. Right. <laughs> right. Well, and this, this is this has been a great conversation. Now, if someone wants to know more about you and what you do and how you might be able to help them, what where would they go? Uh, you can go to my uh, website, Ann Bennett Marketing, or Renegade Branding. Take the archetype quiz; it's on the first page of my website, um, and reach out to me on social. I'm on Instagram. Facebook most of the time. Okay. And we'll have all those links in the show notes. 
And um, yeah, you, you, you can take that. If you're listening here, you can take that test. That's a free Free yeah, that test. archetype, it'll, it'll tell you which archetype you are, and then it sends you, this is how you should be in your products and programs, this is how you should, your languaging, you know, um, and this is Achilles heel. <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah, which is go. good to know. That's good to know. All right. Well, that's great. And I would I would encourage everyone to take that test. It's free, and you might learn something along the way. Very good. Thank you, Anne. This this has been wonderful. And thank you so much for sharing with, with the audience. Thanks. Bye now. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Entrepreneur Journeys. Remember to subscribe so you catch all the episodes and check out the show notes for any free giveaways or gifts that were mentioned during this show. Entrepreneur Journeys is brought to you by Apexable, providing the insights, tools, and transformative structures to help you reach your business summit. I'm your show host, Joe Matz, and until next time, I hope your journey is filled with breathtaking views and successful outcomes.